Please, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, please take the floor. Thank you very much, President Metsola, Prime Minister Orban, honorable members. We meet three weeks later than planned because of the floods that ravaged Central Europe. Five months worth of rain fell on Central Europe in just four days. Extreme weather events are the new normal of climate change. At the same time, its destructive power is too big for any country to fight on its own. The water reached the gates of the most iconic landmarks in Budapest. It destroyed crops and damaged factories. But in these three weeks, we have seen the people of Hungary rolling up their sleeves and helping one another. Europe wants to be at their side. Hungary requested the support of our Copernicus satellites, and we stepped in, and it helped coordinate the rescue teams and map the damage. We are also ready to mobilize our civil protection mechanism and the Solidarity Fund for all countries in the region, including Hungary. Hungary can request our support, as others plan to do. The European Union is there for the people of Hungary in this emergency and beyond. And the Hungarians deserve the full benefits of membership and access to the European funds. <laughs> Honourable members, today I would like to stay focused on some of the most pr pressing issues that we are facing during this presidency of the Council. First, Ukraine. Second, competitiveness. Third, migration. Our Ukrainian friends are heading into the third winter of war. And Russia is trying to make the, it the hardest winter yet. Last month, Russia sent over 1,300 drones against Ukrainian cities. Throughout the summer, hundreds of missiles have rained on Ukrainians' energy infrastructure. Countless Ukrainians have been killed or wounded. Families have been separated. Cities have been destroyed. The world has witnessed the atrocities of Russia's war. And yet, there are still some who blame this war not on the invader, but the invaded. Not on Putin's... There are still some who blame this war not on Putin's lust for power, but on Ukraine's thirst for freedom. So I want to ask them, would they ever blame the Hungarians for the Soviet invasion in 1956? Would they ever blame the Czechs or Slovaks for the Soviet repression of 1968? Would they ever blame the Lithuanians for the Soviet crackdown of 1991? We Europeans, we Europeans may have different histories and different languages, but there is no European language in which peace is synonymous with surrender, and sovereignty is synonymous with occupation. The people of Ukraine are freedom fighters, just like the heroes that freed Central and Eastern Europe from Soviet rule. And there's only one path to achieve a just peace for Ukraine and for Europe. We must continue to empower Ukraine's resistance with political, financial and military support. Last month in Kyiv, I announced that we will provide up to 35 billion euros in loans to Ukraine as part of the $50 billion pledged by the G7. This loan will be repaid by the windfall profits of immobilized Russian assets 
and it will flow directly into Ukraine's national budget. So, we are making Russia pay for the damage it caused, and we will stand with Ukraine through this winter and for as long as it takes. <laughs> Honorable members, the second priority I would like to touch upon is competitiveness. One year ago, in my State of the Union address here in Strasbourg, I announced Mario Draghi's report on the future of European competitiveness. Now we have all heard his call to action. Let me focus on two priority areas. First, on closing the innovation gap with other major economies. Draghi's analysis is very clear on why we are losing ground, especially on breakthrough digital innovations. Too many of our innovative companies have to look at the United States or Asia to finance their expansion, while 300 billion euros of European household savings are invested in foreign markets every year. And too many barriers still exist in our single market, preventing our companies from scaling up across borders. This is why we have proposed a savings and investment union. We need to lower barriers for companies to grow across borders. And we will propose a new push to complete our single market, reduce re regulation on burdens, uh, reduction on burden of reporting in sectors like finance and digital. And this is the direction to travel to strengthen our competitiveness. But what we also see is that one government in our union is heading in the exact opposite direction, drifting away from the single market. I listened very carefully today. How can a government attract more European investments if at the same time it discriminates against European companies by taxing them more than others? How can it attract more companies if at the same time it imposes export restrictions overnight? And how can a government be trusted by European businesses if it targets them with arbitrary inspections, blocks their permits, if public contracts mostly go to a small group of beneficiaries? This creates uncertainty and undermines investors' trust. And all of this at a time when Hungary's GDP per capita has been overtaken by its central European neighbors. Hungary is at the heart of Europe and it should be at the heart of our economy. The Hungarian people should enjoy the full benefits of our single market. Second, the Draghi report calls for a joint plan for decarbonization and growth. Let me address those who still think that we should stick to dirty Russian fossil fuels. Just a few days after Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine, European leaders gathered in Versailles, and all 27, all 27 agreed to diversify away from Russian fossil fuels as soon as possible. So, where are we on that pledge? 1,000 days later, Europe has indeed diversified. We built infrastructures and new ties with reliable partners. We invested in cheap and clean energy that is made in Europe, and with success. In the first half of the year, 50% of all our electricity generation came from renewables, homegrown, our own energy, good jobs in Europe and not in Russia. But not everyone, not everyone has acted on the Versailles commitments. Instead of looking for alternative sources, in particular, one member state just looked for alternative ways to buy fossil fuels from Russia. Russia has proven time and again 
It is simply not a reliable supplier. There can be no more excuses. Whoever wants European energy security, first and foremost, has to contribute to it. That is the rule we have to go. And honorable members, finally on migration. Everybody understands that migration is a European challenge that requires a European answer. And this is why the European Parliament and the Council adopted the new Pact on Migration and Asylum. And now we must implement it. We are already looking at member states, including those at the external borders of our Union, to help them manage our common frontier. Prime Minister, I heard your words over the weekend. You said that Hungary is protecting its border and that criminals are being locked up in Hungary. I just wonder how this statement fits with the fact that last year your authorities released from prison convicted smugglers and traffickers before they did their time. This is not fighting illegal migration in Europe. This is not protecting our union. This is just throwing problems over your neighbor's fence. We all want to better protect our external borders, but we will only be successful if we work together against organized crime and show solidarity among ourselves. And speaking about whom to let in, how can it be that the Hungarian government invites Russian nationals into our union without additional security checks? <laughs> this makes the new Hungarian visa scheme a security risk, not only for Hungary, but for all member states. And how can it be that the Hungarian government would allow Chinese police to operate within its territory? This is not defending Europe's sovereignty. This is a backdoor for foreign interference. Yes, we have to strengthen Frontex. Yes, we have to finalize the legislation on anti-smuggling, reinforce Europol, implement the pact in full, but this can only be achieved with more European cooperation, not less, and of course in full respect of our rule of law and fundamental values. Honorable members, this is the second time that Hungary takes the presidency of the Council. The first time was in 2011. And on that occasion, Prime Minister Orban said, and I quote, we will follow in the footsteps of the revolutionaries of 1956, and we intend to serve the cause of European unity. Europe must stay united to stand its ground." End of quote. I think we all agree. Europe must stand united. This was true back then, and this is still true today. So let me conclude by addressing the Hungarian people. We are one family. Your story is our story. Your future is our future. 10 million Hungarians are 10 million good reasons to keep shaping our future together. Thank you and long live Europe. Thank you.